Okay, good evening and welcome to our session on the pastoral lead manual. And tonight we start off with the first three lessons. Now the first three lessons is about a word we can worship. The, the first lesson is the nature of worship. The second lesson is more the psychology or the meaning of worship and the third lesson is planning worship. How does a pastor in the congregation plan his worship? Now if you, you are on your way to being a pastor in the congregation, so we start at the right point because worship is a very important part of being a pastor because that is what it's all about. So we start off by lesson one. We do everything on this presentation, Microsoft presentation, so let's start off by lesson one. Introduction to the nature of worship. This author, Vital, says that dependency on the higher power is the first and foremost reason why people worship. And he refers to the fact that, that in nature man feels as helpless. He, he can't help himself, he can't control his life. He is actually being as a way in this world without help because of all the powers of, this, of nature. He is, the right word is, he's been uh, on the powers of nature. So he, he needs somebody he can depend upon because he cannot control all these forces himself. And that is the reason why people worship. But worship is the main function of the church. Well, they need to worship something. There must be something up higher. That is what they experience deep down, without knowing what they miss. And the main function of the church is worship. Of course, if God is alive, which we know He is, then worship will be the one thing of we will do towards a deity higher than ourselves. Now we can look a bit on the 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 definition of worship, which we can find in scripture, um, Vital has given us only a few words on that. I believe if we really go and study on the Greek and Hebrew words of worship, there is a lot more um, on that. For instance, he just said, Shachach. Sorry about the A has been left out after the first essence in Shachach. Um, of course, you read that, that CH is a ch in the Hebrew. And that's not the Hebrew, that is a transcription of the Hebrew. So is the other two words, the transcription of the, the Greek words. Proskuneo and Neturgia. Muslims say that um, worship is impossible without needing. Well, that's a good, that definitely says it. Yeah, needing, yeah. That need, need is part of dependence. No, needing like, um, how in the, uh, uh, no. Needing, yes, needing. Wow. They are summing it up 100% because that is what the two words in mean. Shachach means to bow down or to prostrate yourself before the deity or the person, whoever you worship. Proskuneva was actually used as a word in the New, New Testament translating that word Shachach. So maybe if I can just show you a few things. The Hebrew scriptures were all translated into Greek and the New Testament was written in Greek. So what many of the, the authors of the New Testament had because of the study of the Greek scriptures of the Old Testament had a good idea of what words to use when they wrote the New Testament in Greek. And I wouldn't be surprised if Proskuneo is an example of that. And I was that they've directly taken the word from the, the Septuagint, which is 
the Greek Old Testament and used it that way. But as I said, this is a very lean study up till now, very lean, where you can do a much better and deeper study of the meaning of the word of worship in the Bible. I believe there's a lot more to it than just that. But at least that gives us an idea, like you see, uh, the Islam believes that kneeling is part of worship because it's kind of humble expression to make yourself lower than somebody else. So it's prosperous, literally it means to bow the knee. If you know Greek, prosperous means to bow the knee, to prostrate, to kneel, to kiss. That shows you there's a power of intimacy into them. The third word is a word that we found in Luke 1. Luke 1 and 2 where John, uh, uh, John the Baptist's father was uh, doing service in the temple. In that time the people had turns of serving in the temple. And that kind of service they called liturgia. It is this, that kind of service that the priest would give. Now we come to the a description of worship. Worship doesn't consist of just going to church. I believe sometimes people associate worship so much with the church that they think you don't worship with of being in a church building or, to get, or in a way together with other people in that way. And we can clearly see that worship is far more than that. Worship has got to do with your life. We can like to see what, uh, see what it means if we study the scripture uh, uh, in Romans about that. But worship is much more than just that worship is also a dialogue. Worship is a dialogue between man and God. And they, we also see an example of, of, of worship as a dialogue. Uh, when we study the, uh, 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 Jeremiah, for the, uh, Jeremiah 1 and also Isaiah 6. Those two places in the Old Testament gives us a good, but I believe there are many, many, many other places where people are in, in conversation, in dialogue with God. That means God speaks and they answer back. Or God speaks to them and they pray. So uh, dialogue, worship as a dialogue is very much alive and that makes it something that can go beyond a church book. Now we come to symbols of worship. Now maybe we can look at that, uh, before we come to symbols of worship, we can look at Jeremiah 1 verse 4 to 7. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I found you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. The last sovereign Lord. I said, I do not know how to speak, I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. You say to seven, is that? That's to seven, that's right. That's a dialogue. You can see, a dialogue means two persons are speaking to each other. Jeremiah is, is, is in a serious dialogue. I think Moses is a person who also spoke to the Lord. I remember there's one example where he spoke to the Lord about the sins of these lives. I think it's Exodus 52 where they sinned and uh, the Lord said, uh, Moses said to the Lord, Lord, this people, these people are doing this, but blot my name out of the book of life. And the Lord says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to blot your name out. I'm going to punish those who are the, the guilty ones. So uh, there's a, a serious dialogue of people who have dared to speak with God. And Jeremiah was just one example of that. Okay, symbols of worship. 
Uh, they refer to Isaiah 6 verse 1 and further, maybe you can just um, uh, uh, go to that and read Is Isaiah 6 verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. In other words, the um, piece of clothing that came, yeah, from, yeah, then, yeah, okay. that came from um, his robe, okay. filled the uh, temple. More yeah, verse, verse yeah, for five verses. Above each stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. Mm -hmm. With twine he covered his face. And with twine he covered his feet, and with two or twine he did fly. Um, twine meaning two. Mm -hmm. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Should I continue? Yeah, man, that's fine, that's enough. It gives us an idea of symbols. That for instance, the temple and his, his, his robe, that is, the throne he sits on, the, the temple, the smoke, everything refers to something and it refers to the worship. The loud noise means the power of God, but it's all part of worship. So, we worship in symbols. A symbol is something you see, but it refers to something else. Um, a cloud in the sky is a symbol of rain or, or bad weather. Well, uh, uh, if you show a picture of the sky and the sun, everybody thinks it's good weather. It's just a symbol to show about something. If you have a picture, you've got a gun and there it shows violence, for instance. So you've got symbols in the Bible, and I believe in this case it's the same. So, symbols of worship. A Bible goes further on and he, he, he talks about bowing heads and standing in the presence of God. He, he, we, we bow our heads, or we close our eyes, or we stand up. When the presence of God comes. It's all part of symbols and worship is part of that. I'm not, uh, this looks like loose standing things about worship, but you need to go through them and later on maybe get a better picture of the whole about what you refer to. Okay. So, 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 yes. so, 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 do you think like people they used to bow like even they just say God show up like in um, I believe it uh, uh, Gideon when he saw the angel of God and then he bowed down and he saw that for me I'm just asking do you think like it's because um, the the angel of God or God himself just brings uh, his, his presence was like too much uh, so that someone cannot look at him and that the reason just uh, Use that to bring people to go to their knees or to bow down, not to look at them, or what was it so that they are. It's a very good and difficult question you ask because um, a, a, the, the thing that we will think about immediately is will anything happen to us in worship that we don't have control of? Is it something that you, you lose your consciousness or something will force you down? My personal opinion is no. I think never ever in the Bible God forces anything on anyone. But in the Old Testament, in, when Moses was at the Mount Sinai, there were a real dangerous punishment for people who has gone outside of certain boundaries. But within boundaries, I don't think God punishes anyone or force anyone into anything. Worship is always to God, our living God, is always voluntary. God is too big to force you to worship Him. There are so much consequences if you don't. Um, never again. I, out of a more charismatic background, I will say, uh, I think the experience of people 
in, in this situation where this presence of God is really, really, really strongly felt, is more people will move out of their own will bow and, and show reverence and praise God. I, 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 that is the picture I get from all the, the visions I see in the Bible and also in, in Revelation, if you take Revelation, the moment, the 24, that the, the, the cherubim brings honor to God, the 24 hours prostrate, they fall down, that word that we had there. That is a voluntary thing, but it's a compelling thing, but a voluntary thing. Uh, if you, if, if, if I tell a joke, and it's funny, you still in a way have a control to laugh about it or not. Isn't that true? Yes. You have a, a manner, a way of control, a manner of control over that, a, a degree of control. You can decide, I'm going to laugh for this and keep it in, or you can go along with it and enjoy whatever it is to be and laugh. And you can also choose to stop laughing. I don't think it will in any way be a forcible thing. I think when the real presence of God comes, for anybody to stay up standing and not fall down in reverence will be difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and it will be a sign of, I didn't experience anything. I'm not there, I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And God, even in that case, God will not force a person down. You, you see in the hidden religions, in the pagan religions, like in, in, in Babel, Babylon, where they, the, that three guys, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, yes. when they, they didn't prostrate, they were in trouble, they took them in. Mm -hmm. But God doesn't work like that. God doesn't need to force you to worship. There are enough things in life that will bring you out to worship a living God. Yes. I think that's what you experience. Thank you. Okay. There's internal, and you will see this now, internal, external, nature of worship. That means inside you, there's something about worship which you do it out of your heart, you mean it. That is internal, and external is the way you show your worship to, in, in, in ways like activities you take part in. In other words, the activities are normally talk about as worship. Like, for instance, we sing in the church, we sing hymns to God. That is worship. We refer to that as worship. But actual, the internal part that happens is also worship. That's actual worship. If I read my Bible correctly, God put a, 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 a great deal of emphasis on that thing about internal worship. Okay, now we go more, okay, first of all, before we do that, I'm going to do a, a, a view, unfortunately, we don't have time to do it in detail, but Romans 12 verse 1 is a feast of worship. I can tell you it refers to, that word the two here that already we have seen is mentioned in Romans 12. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting word that Paul used here. The fact that he used that word for priestly service, mm -hmm. as when he said, that is your reasonable service. Mm -hmm. Now, um, maybe we should just read Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. Is there anybody who can read that for us? Uh, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in a view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve that God's will is, uh, is, is good, pleasing and perfect will. Okay, that is saying it in a nutshell, but that is a huge, rich mix of a lot of interesting things. But that describes us that worship is at what Paul is concerned is a much deeper thing that we, in our being, does, we as a, uh, that we do towards God with inside, with our lives. Mm -hmm. Worship entails our lives. Mm -hmm. And he compares it with animal sacrifice. Do you, do you know it? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. 
He refers to the Turga, refers to the Old Testament, the sacrificial services. And he talks about holy, and he talks about God acceptable um, uh, living uh, sacrifice. He talks about that word sacrifice. So he was referring to the Old Testament, and those words were remarkable if you compare it to the Old Testament priestly service. So he says, actually, the same as what the priest do with the animal, somewhere must be available like that animal to be at God's disposal to take us wherever He wants us and to do with us whatever He wants. That is a true heart of worship. I'm glad he mentions it because I think Ramadan Star was one of the fundamental to worship. Okay, we come now to the theological foundations of worship. The doctrine of creation. Man is a created being and therefore dependent. We already started out with dependent. But the creation of man, the fact that he's created, means he's part of the dust of the earth. He's part of the fiber of the earth. He's part of the whole world. He is flesh and he's living in a material world. And that means he is he's so much integrated in the world. He, nature has control over him. He needs food. He needs shelter. He needs all of these. And he's dependent upon that. And his lack of what he gets in life makes him even more reach out and is dependent upon a higher being to help him through this. When he feels vulnerable, when he is in fear of things that will happen. In the past that was even more so than today. Today we think we control nature more because we build brick wall houses, we put a roof on and we think we are secure. But if you watch nowadays on the news that happened with, with earthquakes, you're not safe anywhere on earth. If a meteor strikes the earth, we done for. I tell you, it's, we don't have, we don't stand a chance with the forces of nature. It's just something out of this world. We we cannot control our universe that much. Without the forces of nature, look at your bodily forces. How easy you can get ill, and you only got you live 120 years at the most. And you're not here anymore. Your body grows old. There are physical conditions. That makes man fully dependent as a created being on earth. And with that urgent call or need inside him, there's a two-way of responding. Who of you can tell me what's a two-way of responding? What can a man do if he has got the urges, urge to worship God? Or the need inside to worship What are these two things? What do you think? What can he do? He can do one of two things. Um, he can express thankfulness, or he can um, do service. Okay, but that's two positive things. What are the negative things he can do? Oh, we can forget God and um, reject Him. Ignore Him or, or reject Him and say, I don't need God, I'm going to try to make my out of the material world the best I can do for myself and that's all I can do. So in other words, he doesn't want to serve God, he doesn't want to worship God, he rather choose the other way. So reject God or he can accept God and bow down in worship and, and Show gratitude towards God. Those are the two ways of responding. Yeah. Right, now we come to a very important part of God's work, which plays an important role with us as Christians today. The New Testament part. We look at the redemptive part, the redemptive work of Christ as part of worship. is God's complete revelation. It's a big theology that we don't have time to discuss it in full, what it means, 
the ins and outs of that, but that is a very rich statement. So, when it comes to worship, worshiping Christ should be the first and foremost act of, of believers as Christians today. We, God has, has, has completed His work in Christ. That's what He wants to do towards man. His benevolence towards man is completed through Christ. Uh, work and that is his work of uh, uh, being manifested as flesh, being in the flesh on earth, and then also willing to die to take the ultimate punishment of the cross for us. That brings man to worship. That is the ultimate worship. That makes man doubly obligated to God. First of all, why is man doubly obligated to God? We've discussed that. You give the answer. Maybe you can remember from Tuesday, Tuesday night. What was that double obligation? We said we were doubly obligated because first God created us um, with the um, ability to serve Him and He created us as good being, uh, beings in the sense that He's were fearfully and wonderfully made and so, so good things that God, uh, God uh, made and the righteous law that he has um, obligates us to work uh, worship him. But now that we have completely failed the law and actually deserve to be destroyed, um, he has even saved us from that damnation. So not only are we to worship him because he created us, but we are also to worship him because um, he saved us. Very good answer. That is the full answer. I hope everyone else on the video also gets that answer. Otherwise, we are obligated to worship because He made us and we are doubly obligated because after we failed, He took us back again through the redemptive work of Christ and therefore also we need to worship Him for that. Wonderful. Thanks a lot for that. We call it the second chance. If you don't believe God as a second chance God, a merciful second chance God, please read your Bible again. God is a God of second chances. We get nowadays today people react towards the injustice in the world by swinging back and saying, no, 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 we can't talk of second chances. Then people will get slack and the world will be a bad place. I tell you the opposite is true. The opposite is true. The more merciful we can be, the more merciful we can be and give people second chances in our lives, the more God will get the glory for that. That is not what people says, that's what I say. Okay, the way in which we celebrate this redemptive work of Christ is two way with the two things that they left over from the uh, Roman Catholic sacraments, the two sacraments we got left over from that. I believe there are much more to this than just sacraments, but is the Lord's Supper and the Baptism. The Lord's Supper, the communion, we partake of the Lord's body and His blood and we celebrate Christ's death. The, 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 the communion depicts sacrificial death. It shows you that that was a sacrifice to redeem us. So we celebrate that when we have the Lord's Supper because that's His body and His blood. His body being broken for us to give us life and His blood is there to cleanse us from sin. So the, the, this is the way of how we worship God is by partaking in the Lord's Supper, the thankfulness of what He's done for us. You will see gratitude, thankfulness plays a tremendous important role in this, in, in this uh, uh, celebration of, of His redemptive work. And then baptism also as a to die in Christ and be risen again. That, that is a symbol of Christ has died and is risen, so you die in, 
in, in, in Christ's death and you get raised up to a new life. That is what the baptism stands for. Very powerful symbolism. Very powerful. Wonderful too. Very clear, uh, clear symptoms of clear symbols of our Christian worship. Then there's something about God's personal presence. God's personal presence is the Holy Spirit. And it's the presence of the inbound Christ. The same thing and that convicts us of sin. Right, now we come to worship in the Old Testament. I tell you, this, the author just touches on certain issues in worship in the Old Testament. It's a vast, wider, much broader subject than just taking it in a few instances. First of all, we're going to worship outside of Israel. You know that Israel was always encompassed or, or encircled by other nations. And they were also influenced by them. We can easily see that and we will easily recognize a lot of places here when you can see Israel's neighbors have a big influence on them as well. Because we write about it, we, we read about it in the, in the Old Testament. Um, I'm just going to mention a few here. There are a long list um, that the vehicle has given us. Uh, but I think we, we can just name a few. Uh, we, please go and read all of that. If you have questions about it, we can discuss that later in the class. We don't have time to really go into it. I'm just going to mention, go right to mention it, and, and I won't go into the details and explain to you about that. The Tower of Babel is one, it's a, it's a shrine of worship that gets mentioned in the Bible. If people don't read Genesis 6 very well, Genesis 5 with the Tower, tower of Babel. They, when I was young, I thought the Tower of Babel is just a tower and the guys were physically trying to get to God. I think he's very high and if they make a tower right long, they will get to God. That's not what is meant by that. It's meant to make a step up high place that you can be closer to God and then offer sacrifices on the heights. Many times the Lord talks about Sac uh, sacrificial sacrifices on the heights. And Tower of Babel was a Babylonian uh, temple, a ziggurat. They called it the ziggurat. It was built for the Mesopotamian deities. And it, 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 it depicts a, 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 a king who is in prayer with angels flying above him, carrying a, a, a vases of water. Okay, so it was a place of worship. Then another deity that we read about, we, do you know where you read about it? In 1 Samuel 5. Do you know, do you know the story? 1 Samuel 5 of Dagon. Yeah. What nation was that? Where the, he, he was the deity of what nation? Are we talking about Dagon? Dagon. The Philistines. The Philistines. The Philistines. The Philistines. Worshipped by the Philistines. And you know what happened there? He fell down before the if Ark of God. The Ark of God was put next to Dagon and Dagon fell to the ground. That was very classic. I was going to really read Andoy once I will tremendously. Go read that for yourself. But Dagon was a great god. And he, he, he was seriously worshipped by the Philistines and many other a Canaanite or Mesopotamian um, um, people, especially the Philistines. Then we uh, uh, tell about Ishtar. I'm not, I won't be surprised if Ishtar, come, if Ishtar comes from Ishtar, one is the goddess of love and fertility. You know, the bunnies, the eggs, Easter eggs, and the bunnies, it was all part of fertility religion that unfortunately the Western world has copied. We don't really uh, celebrate Passover, we make Easter bunnies and eggs, and as, which has nothing to do with it anyway. So, but um, that is where, where it comes from. Ishtar, the goddess of love, and Thomas, the god of plants. We know that um, Ishtar, um, God rescued um, uh, Thomas in the other world. There's something about that that describes that. 
Let me just read it to you here. The, uh, each time the goddess of love goes into the other world to see Tammuz, the god of plants, res resurrected annually. And this resurrection comes in the celebration of spring. So you know that the, the heathen nations, the pagan nations, were really, to a great degree, uh, celebrating the normal nature cycle of life. And you can find that even in today's religion, that religion that comes very much so. I know people, guys, who go and swim in the, in, in the icy cold waters on the, on the solstice in winter to celebrate it. So people are coming back to that kind of religion where the, uh, uh, the forces of nature or the, the, the struggle of nature is important to them. Then Marduk was the sun god, sun god of, uh, uh, in, in, that, in the ancient Near East. Egypt made gods as animals, they depicted their gods as animals. If you can study that, for instance, the, the, the Anubis, the dogs at the gates of the underworld, you know about that, that's one example. And I wouldn't be surprised if the players of the Egyptians, we said a lot of animals in were sort of a way of God showing to them the animals are not your, it's not real gods and they are not a match for the God of Israel. No time to explain anything more about that. Family cults in Mesopotamia. Pillars of Guns, which is a sexual connotation, very strong fertility religion. El the Canaanite God, which is also in the Bible, must be honest with you, it's a word in the Bible for God. Hmm. Beth El, house of God. It was a Canaanite God. I'm not, I have no time to explain to you why it's in the Bible, I can't leave, but there's a very good reason for that. Then a, 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 a God that we know a lot about in the Bible to read about is Baal the storm god, the lord of heaven. Baal was a general term in the days of, of Esau's time in, in Canaan because Baal was, was worshipped there. And he was a lord. He was, that was the common word for God as lord. You get a, a, a part in the Bible where it is interchangeable with lord. Of course, we know that Baal is not the Lord Jehovah of, of this, the one that Israel should worship. They worship Baal, but that was a sin that they fell in because that was, an, uh, 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 that was the God of the Canaanites who lived in, yeah, of the people that live in Canaan. Okay. So, the story is about Baal and Lord. Mot is the, the uh, Canaanite word there for death, okay? You know that? Mot in, in Hebrew is death, okay? You know that. So, Pale and um, uh, uh, Mot killed Pale and took him to the other world, so Anath went down to the other world to and destroyed Mot and he took his remains and throw it in the field and then the spring time life came up again. So it's, it depicts the life cycle. Okay, I don't have time to say anything more about Elijah and the, and the priest prophets of Baal, which is a very familiar piece, but I don't have time to explain that because I'm just going to mention it. Sacrifice and ritual done to appease magic gods and goddesses. Okay? Sorry, man. Uh, that's your God and the God is. Okay. Then, sacrifices like cutting themselves, um, plucking out their hair, doing a lot of things which were just rituals. Why they did that, they don't understand. It comes out of their own mythology, but it was meaningless. So we see at the, uh, 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 the, the events on the Mount Carmel. The, the prophets of Baal tried a lot to, to, to appease Baal to get him to come to life and do something and they were struggling in vain, they cut themselves even. And the Lord had actually forbid the, um, his own people to do that. They were not allowed to cut themselves. Some of them sit in sackcloth, 
as we said, said that was also part of it, but that was not so serious to cut himself. God has put some boundaries there, because he's, he doesn't want us to take part in the pagan way of doing, because it was meaningless suffering, not bringing us closer to God, not bringing anything about, prevailing, uh, availing nothing. Some people when they go, uh, um, when they worship their false gods, they go and get t tattoos, and when they're being tattooed, um, the process of tattooing is um, as this weird um, pen that make that sticks a blade into your skin the whole uh, uh, time. Then sometimes a bit of blood appears in your skin. Then they lick off the bl uh, blood in order to do a blood sacrifice that will go away. So um, sure. Yeah, tattooing is a bad thing. Um, um, we all get a butterfly in the stomach when we hear about tattooing. As, as Christians, when we hear about them, it's very important that we know that there is definitely a spiritual side to it. Uh, on the other hand, we must never be judgmental towards other people who do that, although we can warn them against it. I think some people, Christians do that. Some Christians come and tattoo a, a, a religion word on their, on their body nowadays. They do that. It's a very difficult thing. I, 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 we can say, no, please don't do it, but some of them have got their heart in that. And to them it's very important. How to approach that is another discussion, which we don't have time for. But the worship was also expressed to these people in leaping, dancing, shouting, etc. They, and that was outward activities. We must be careful that our religion is not all outward activity, lacking the deep heart of the matter. Worship comes from the heart. And you cannot appease God by shouting and jumping and doing a lot of outward things and think God is going to listen to you because that. We have learned that lesson out of the events in Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal and Elijah and uh, in, in 1 Kings 17 and 18 and 19. We, we know that doesn't happen. Worship of fertility gods normally resulted in sexual orgies. That if you if you can study uh, the history of these uh, 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 fertility gods, there's always a type of a sexual ritual in the temple, which have temple prostitutes of both, both male and female. And uh, it's interesting that uh, Eli's sons were, were doing the same things that the Eden did. They were sleeping with the, with the girls uh, in the temple of God, who were doing their sacrifices. Eli, sons. Pinya, Hophni and Pinyas. I don't know if you read that, but yes. they were as, as Israel was partaking in the same sins and the Edens. Not to mention that God were, were com completely prohibited any pagan religion in this world. God was in the process, the Lord in the process of men times trying to wipe out it. That's why God says, wipe them out, chase them out of the country, kill them all. Because they are going to draw you into their religion. And you know what happened? They didn't kill them. And what happened? They started worshipping pagan gods. And in the end, we know what happened. The Israelites were taken with the story and the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, a small tribe, were taken into exile to later of the 70 years to return again. But worship in Israel, we, we also had activities and rituals in. We read about Adam and Eve. What was Adam and Eve's worship? How did they worship God? How did Adam and Eve worship God? I believe it's by doing uh, what has been taught them by God in their garden. They walked with God in the garden. They sit there in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve had a walk with God 
in conversation with God. They talk to yes. each other. Yeah. Wouldn't that be wonderful to be like that? They had no worries. They didn't have to worry about anything. Yeah. All the food was around them. They didn't have to work like us for the food. It was given to them as free. The tree of life was there. They could just pick it and eat it. The tree of life. And walk with God. Yes. It was simple. And then they made a bad choice. The bad choice we also would have made if we were in these shoes. Don't think of yourself as better than Adam and Eve. You say, ah, if I know now, I wouldn't. But we choose a lot of wrong things in our life. So we can't really point the finger to them. Yes. But uh, walking with God in the garden was, was how Adam and Eve worship. Worship came in and able out that they worship. They brought sacrifice. sacrifices. What was the difference between Cain and Abel's sacrifice? That's a very interesting one with people that still debating about why did God accept Abel's sacrifice but not Cain's sacrifice? Why? What is the reason for it? Uh, well, um, the, uh, when Cain is upset because God is accepting um, Abel's sacrifice, then God tells Cain, don't you know that when you do good, you will be accepted, it, and when you do bad, um, you will be rejected. So, somewhere th throughout his life, he was uh, sinning, um, and so that's why sacrifice was rejected. That's a good point. Um, yes, what do you say? Uh, uh, for me, I believe that the, the problem of uh, like attitude of each of them. Definitely an attitude problem. So I think it was attitude. Uh, Abel, for him, he just put God first. He must just give what is best for God. What was that best? What, what was best for him is that's the, uh, the, 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 the animal who was fed and just... In that was Abel, animal, right? That's Abel. But for Khan, him is just a thing, you know, I cannot just come and take something which is not, God I can still give him the small one, it's fine, it's not a problem. So the thing is about the choice and the attitude toward what is coming from inside toward God. That's what you, you, you both got a very good piece of, of, of it together because it seems they are safe, God accepted, you know, in Hebrew, this guy. Other than that, Argue with what the Bible says about it. I want to mention something else. Yes. Do you realize what kind of sacrifice did Cain uh, brought? The fruit of the of the vegetables. And what did Cain do of the animals? Slaughtered yes. blood yes. covenant. Yes. Because Cain sat with his sin in his life. Mm. He had sin in his heart. He was the one who should have done the animal sacrifice. To bring reconciliation between him and God. What did he do? He sidestepped it and he brought the other. He sidestepped the communion, true communion through blood sacrifice. Blood sacrifice from the time of Cain and Abel plays a tremendous role. What kind of blood sacrifice did he bring later? He killed his brother. Yes. So when you don't sacrifice, don't believe in Jesus and don't take up the blood sacrifice, as a Christian that you believe in Jesus, the enemy tries to get you to kill other people as a blood sacrifice. Okay, think about it. I don't have time to explain that further. It's a very rich thing. I've only recently realized that. Now also at the altar after the ark, he came out of the ark, he built the altar and sacrificed the altar. Abraham made the works the same when they got into the promised land. Abraham, that was how Abraham talked to God. He built an altar and he worshipped God. Yes. So did all the patriarchs. Go and study that. They all did build altars and sacrifice on it. Now we come to a second, uh, uh, another uh, development into worship. From the informal patriarch sacrifices here and there to a system of sacrifice implemented by God on Mount Sinai with Moses, by giving him instruction of how it should be done, where and how, because now it's going to be a continuous way of living. 
sacrificing animals, spilling their blood for forgiveness of sins. That was becoming a part of Israel's way of living. And that was done by the tabernacle service. Okay? Exactly that way. And uh, so they partook in that and they worshipped God by having the tabernacle with the altar and all the other symbols of the tabernacle there as part of the worship of God. And that was ordained by God. It was a fixed institution, not sporadic anymore. It was now ordained and fixed. That was the way of how you would get rid of your sin. You would go to the priest there and, and uh, bring an animal and you would kill it and on certain other things you would do other things as well. But that was the way God would uh, you would worship God in the time of the tabernacle in the, in the Sinai desert. Then I, uh, I, Aaron and his sons brought that other service in again that, that we, we spoke of like liturgia that was the start of the liturgia well that word didn't exist that time there were well, other Hebrew words to describe that so that, those were the work, that, that is the way that God wanted them to do that right we talked about the tabernacle in the desert which is part of worship in the tabernacle or part of the tabernacle in the uh, the small uh, 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 Ark of the Covenant the Aaron in Hebrew was the laws of God, the two tables, uh, that a table uh, uh, class of, um, that God gave to Moses on the mount. There was um, also, um, okay, let's forget about the table of showbread. Let's just, just focus on the, the ark itself. There was a, 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 a Aaron's a rod was in there. And then the, the, the two tables, stone tables of the law was inside. So the law became part of the God's given, God's way. The law was part of the worship. They worship God by obeying His law. Okay? But apart, that, apart from that, there was the animal sacrifice all the time. And Around that uh, was the whole ritualistic way of obeying the law in the way that Israelites lived in the desert. There were 622 laws, 10 of them which were the Ten Commandments. You don't have to know that, I'm just saying that for interesting sake. And on top of this uh, Ark of the Covenant, was what we call the mercy seat where the cherubim was. The two cherubim uh, 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 bent over from each side on top of the, this Ark of the Covenant and there we call it the mercy seat. That was where the priest once a year went in and represented with the blood of the lamb offered it as a sacrifice to atone for man's sin. That was the ultimate the ultimate worship. Interesting that the blood of the Lamb of Christ is our ultimate worship today. We sometimes make really uh, small of that. We don't really understand how amazing the blood of the Lamb is and how important it is in our worship. And we, of which communion is part of it. We just take part in communion. But communion is a very, very, very special way of celebrating our faith and worshipping God. Okay, later on in David's time, the tabernacle was very important to David. You can see the way he handled it. Well, God learned him, taught him a few lessons in handling the, the, uh, 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 the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. He put it on a wagon instead of priest carrying it. And when this wagon there was a problem in a, in a, in a small ditch, ditch yard. In the, that's the word I was thinking about, ditch. The, it slipped and one of the guys, the, 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 the driver's 
put out his hand to Saul and he tried to, to protect the covenant ark from falling and he was struck down by God immediately. So God taught David a lot about this ark of the covenant that this place of worship was not to be touched by me and not to do it your way but to do it God's way. That is the lesson God taught David about it. So David, um, God taught him a few lessons and later on when the temple was built in his son's time, the temple was the fixed way of the tabernacle and that was at one place. So worship in Israel centered then around the temple in Jerusalem and that remained like that for a very long time. Later on we know that the temple was destroyed when uh, the, the Jews were taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar, if I'm not mistaken. The place was burned down and the temple was destroyed. And it was only rebuilt in Herod's time, later. And it was not the same glory as it was. So the temple period ended then and with that, the height of Israel's worship also ended. So worship shifted from there on. We can know there was definitely a shift. But we know that God has meant put those temporary symbols there. Remember we talked about symbols earlier. God put the temporary symbols there as a way in which He wants to... A symbol refers you to something better. Coming up. This was not the end. We know we read that a lot in Hebrews. Hebrews. Hebrews tells us a lot about the symbols of the Old and the New Covenant. The one is reflecting, is just showing us the way to the other one, which is actually the way God wants us to go. In other words, the deeper inner worship. Now in this world, there were, there were also a lot of feasts. You can go and read up about it. I know two limits about the feast, but there is a lot you can say about that. The Passover, which you know, uh, 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 comes from the Hebrew word Peshach, which means to pass over. Not to stand still, but to pass over. And that comes when the angel of death passed over the houses where the blood was. Huh? Remember that? Yeah. They took it, they slaughtered the lamb, they took the blood, and they painted it on the doorposts and because of that the angel of death didn't go into the houses that had the blood on yes. so that, in that case they were passed over they didn't get the punishment that the other people got that is also there is a big thing in that as well eh? so you celebrate that you celebrate deliverance that's a way of worshiping God let's look at the day way of worship worship in other words has something to do with God is acting, we recognize what is acting in, in, in gratitude. And we stand in all gratitude to what God has done and that changes us inside so that we live better lives. That is our actual worship. Can you understand the flow of it going? So Passover was a sign of that. The Jews still today celebrate Passover, but they don't know what they are. So really celebrating because they don't want to believe in the real significance of that which is Christ's suffering and death and the blood of the Lamb and God delivered us from evil from the, the sure death of punishment for our sins they don't believe in that but they still back at the old, old covenant yes but they do believe in the um, so, uh, um, exodus from Exodus. Yes, they believe in the Exodus. Now, of course, that's what, but they don't understand the meaning of the Exodus yeah, the to further to what God wants it to yeah, be. The prophecy. The prophecy about it. They, don't, they stopped it. They stopped short of that, unfortunately. The feast of the unleavened bread, unleavened bread is bread with no yeast in, also a way as the Jews celebrate gratitude. Actually, it, it points to something much more than that. It points to sinless life, you know, sin-free life. Take out the yeast, take out the, the wrong stuff out of your life. If you are in gratitude, do that. 
But that's not the reason we're talking about the reason why the celebrant is gratitude, the offering of first fruits, they bring all the first fruits uh, uh, after the harvest, you know, normally normally in the time of autumn when the season is gone, then they would harvest the fields and they would bring it in, in to God and lay the first fruits and things be tasked before God as a sign of the gratitude. And the Feast of Booths, which is also Thanksgiving. The Feast of Booths, the Sukkot, they call it in Hebrew. So it comes from the, the, the plural of Sukkah, which means a temporary hut or a, a temporary dwelling, a, a thing or something that they built in front of the shack, like they built in front of their house. And they stayed in the shack for the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. So Today, Christians. Uh, um, um, celebrate the, fe the Feast of Tabernacles uh, in many other ways as long as Christ is, is, is glorified by that we really shouldn't have a problem with that but we don't do, do not turn into Jews when we do that and we're not supposed to too much think that we can have to become Jews and follow all the feasts ritually like the Jews in order to be correct Christians. That, that is not biblical, that's not right. We don't need to do that. We can celebrate God from the heart. But I've got taken in the Feast of Tabernacles, and it's, it's wonderful if Christians come together and, and, and worship God in that way and dance and feast and do something in the feast of wonderful things. But you must be careful because humans also have feasts, but they have feasts for different reasons. Have all Jesus and a lot of other stuff in their feast that we don't as Christians believe in. But therefore God knows that, therefore He is always concerned what is in our heart in worship. Heart in worship is the main thing that it's about. Okay. Then we can see a, a, a piece of the Bible that I've learned from when I was still very young in church. They would read this. With what shall I go before God? What will I present to God as an atonement for my sins? Is He interested in this? Is He interested in this? Is He interested in this? And it shows you a lot of, talks about a lot of rituals and things that people in the old covenant would believe in doing. God says, no. You must do what is right. You, want, you must uh, 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 love mercy. That is a very important one. Love mercy. And it would be gracious to other people. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. That is the three main things God would ask of you to do. So, worship in the time of Micah, of the prophets have changed because the prophets saw what the ritualistic ceremonial things, sacrifices uh, didn't accomplish. He saw the lack of it and he came up with the heart of the matter. That is why the prophetic is so important showing the new way to the new covenant. It shows you that the old way of ritual worship doesn't work. It's too much hidden stuff in without your heart being changed. So God is interested in your heart to be changed. Right now we come, that was the, the last of the prophetic of the Old Testament, shows to the New Testament. Now is worship in the New Testament. How does it look like that? Right, we get worship in the New Testament times. That means in the year like um, New Testament times is difficult to, to find, it uh, all depends on from what corner you look at it, but we look at the time when the Apostles was there. The Apostles were um, in Jerusalem and the time of Jesus, or just after Jesus, that first hundred years after Jesus, we say it's New Testament times, or even the first century, I would believe, and we repeat the description. And during the New Testament times, or the time of the con congregation, which is actually the 30 years after Jesus died, 
that time period. We're talking of that during that time period. The worship was baptism, so they took baptism very seriously, preaching, and the Lord's Supper. Remember Peter preached? That we can all get it out of people who were baptized. We read about people who were baptized in the period, just in Acts, we read all this in Acts. Eh? I would say that New Testament time referred to the Gospels and Acts. Okay. That is New Testament time. So that we take us to about 70, 80 AD. If you want to, all depends on where you put Acts. How, well, it's off the loop because it's written by the same author, so it's just off the loop. Look, we would estimate it's about um, 70 AD, so Acts would be 80. Yeah, let's say 80 AD would be a good. So we're talking about the time of Acts after Jesus went to about 80 AD when that was written. Those were the, the, the worship of the of, of the of those New Testament times. Um, baptism, preaching and the Lord's Supper. Also prayers and scripture reading. What kind of scripture reading was that? What scripture did they read? They read the Old Testament? Yeah, it couldn't be the New Testament because it was still to be written. Yeah. When is the first book of the New Testament dated? What date? Um, and what book is it? Okay. According to scholars, uh, uh, scholars, it's the first Thessalonians and 48 AD. Okay, but and the first gospel was to many people say Mark, Mark, and 60 AD. There's a lot of theory why they say Mark, where Mark got all this information from, and where all the other gospel authors got them. Then all through the Judaistic rituals were still some of the Jewish. You must understand this Judaism uh, um, concept. Judaism, uh, people followed the way of Christ, some of the Jews, but most of the Jews didn't follow Christ. They still kept to the things that were taught them by the Pharisees and Sadducees, especially more the Pharisees. They were uh, uh, responsible for doing the religious thing in Israel. They were the religious rulers, the Pharisees. And they kept the, the Jews under the hand of the law. You know, the, six, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, they kept them under the law. They should obey the law. That's why they always argue with Jesus about the law, the law, the law. The law was the, 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 the chain or the stick of control that the Pharisees had on the Jews. And they made sure. So when the gospel started out, they persecuted the Christians, the Jews that would became Christians because they were not more under the law. They had to come out under the law and start to follow Christ's teachings, which were not Judistic. Never Paul is so serious about Christians who would go back and think that Judaism is still applicable, all those laws, all those things, you must obey just like that. That's a long discussion, I don't have time for that. But some of the Jews were still keeping all these rituals. And Paul didn't like that, he also had a problem with that, we can read his, uh, his epistles, like Galatians for instance, he's very, very, very um, serious about the fact that you can't be a Jew and a Christian at the same time. There's, there's, there's no way. You can be a Jewish Christian, but you cannot be a Jew and a Christian at the same time. It's impossible. But we can discuss that at some other time. But those were, were still uh, kept. And after, after the destruction of the temple, the Jews were forced to worship in synagogues. It was very difficult for them, for the temple to be destroyed. But it, because the temple was the actual place where they worshipped. That's why you still get to that Orthodox Jews and stand at the wall, the West Wall, you know about the West Wall, and the West Wall is very holy to the Jews. But it's part of a destroyed temple, it's part of a destroyed religion. It's destroyed, it's over, it's 
God has put an end to it. He says, the continuance of it is now a different kind of worship. Paul talks a lot about it. Other authors of the New Testament talks about it. I'm not going to go on in that because that's a subject on its own. And Christianity was influenced by this uh, this sin of worship in synagogues. If you go read, Jesus visits synagogues and preached there. Paul preached in synagogues. So the Jews had much the same way of what we do because we, lot, we copied a lot of the way of doing things from the Jews. Now we go to the more later historical development. Now we know the church is not a Jewish uh, 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 sect anymore. The church is developed into the church. It's becoming all the more separate from the Jews. A lot of things happen to, con to, to actually enhance that, which we can't discuss now. But uh, we can read in the early, early um, even as early as Clemens of Alexandria, that is the church fathers. The church fathers were the people just after the apostles. They got the church fathers, and after the, the, the church fathers, you get the apologists. Okay? Apologeten. The guys who, 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 who defend the, the Christianity against the onslaught of the pagan Roman uh, government which actually were persecuting them and they were actually defending what they believed in because there were a lot of uh, wrong ideas formed about Christianity because of you know like for instance the, the celebrating Jesus' death was to them and a very pagan like not even pagan it was a very vicious way of a blood sacrifice and all that they, uh, they didn't like that at all, the more civilized Romans. And if uh, the apologists um, um, uh, uh, had to defend the, the Christianity against them. But uh, here's the church father that he says that reading from the word, confession of sins, and acknowledging of the Holy Spirit's presence and salvation, proclamation of the word of God and hymns. Were, were elements of worship from the time of just after the Apostles' era, which is the end of the first century, maybe just a bit like that. Then we get the 140 AD, which is the second century, the time of the Apology, Scripture reading, addressed by the President. Now we get a bit more of a movement. There was a big leader coming to the front, and he was leading like so like the, it was like an early development of a pastor leading, you know, a leader in the church. And they, they, the apostles were the leaders of the church. But they were not like standing up and saying, I'm the big boss around. But now the time comes that these time for, to, in the time of confusion, people always want the leader. Eh? Yeah. So I think that was what they call here the president. Prayer, thanksgiving, and the use of Amen. That shows you, um, we read about the word Amen. The, uh, the word Amen is actually Greek, but it comes from the Hebrew word Aman, which is our word, is the word for belief. It means surety, a confirmation. It is surely so. I believe it. It's that false. Okay? That's where the word Amen comes from. But it's a, it's, it, it's a good. It's Greek, it comes out of the community, it was a later development after the Old Covenant. So, th therefore, it's a Greek word, yeah. Uh, distribution of bread and wine. Then we get the Lord's Supper. Very, very definitely. And amazing enough, a collection for the poor. So, they actually carried on with what the apostles were doing, feeding people and helping the poor. That was part of what Paul says about collecting for the poor. That's part of God's plan. Today we see in South Africa people are doing that to the poor farmers who are struggling to survive. It's no rain for five years and they are struggling and they're not making it and now people are paying money to keep them going again. Then in the third and fourth century there were a lot of 
change in the church. Who can tell me why? What happened in the third and fourth century? It became um, the state church, the church, the legal religion. Okay. In the fourth century, who was the guy then? Constantine. Constantine the Great. Constantine the Great was actually a Roman emperor who defeated the other Roman emperor who was actually anti-Christianic. He defeated him in a battle. And in the battle that defeated him, he saw a sign in heaven which he said was a cross. But some of the people believe it was not a cross. What was it? What do they believe was it? Some people um, believe it was an uh, Egyptian Anubis. Now, the Egyptian Ankh, they call it the Ankh. It was like a cross, but the top part was not a, a stripe, it was a circle. So it looked like the, fe the female sign nowadays. The, the, the female sign, so it was a sign of life. And the Egyptian Ankh is not the cross at all, it's an opposite. It stands for fertility. Kind of thing. So people uh, believe Constantine the Great to be a compromiser of Christianity, and that is exactly what he did. He took in all the heathen priests into the church when he came to the church because he, he either would have killed them or, or bring them in as Christians. So guys just took Christianity on without really believing in it because it saved their lives because they would have been killed. He says, if you don't want to become a Christian, you did. So they all became Christians. We do not follow that kind of behavior. We cannot force anybody into the kingdom of God and never ever will ever be right to do that. When was that repeated? Well, in the Crusades. The Crusades and no. also in the Reformation by some of the reformers. Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yes. That is part of our shame history. We shouldn't be proud of that. The crusade especially, they even killed their own people. And we, it's a very bad thing. The, cr the crusade, um, histori historically, um, the Christians were very pr uh, pressured. And um, if it wasn't for the cr uh, crusade, we, uh, crusade, we wouldn't have the Western world as we have it today because Islam was taking over and destroying everything. So, we should, in a sense, we should be very glad that the Crusades happened. Yeah, we, we, we wouldn't know in what world we would have lived in. But Western world was more or less that. Okay. Greater for, in the third and fourth century, greater formalism as a church grew as a church. And then, with Constantine establishing as a state church, everything burst out of his are um, um, the seems in the fourth century it became like a formalism church. Everybody was a Christian, everybody was wore a cross and there was a pride symbol. But of course if you do that you get a weakened Christianity. And then in the church they crept in stuff that we call sac sacramentalism. What is that? Ordinances by which we um, become more holy. Mostly. Okay, and sacerdotalism. Okay, sacerdotalism means the authority that is carried over only by priests. Those two things were hand in hand. Because what happens is in the in the church in the church in, in the New Testament times, apostles were the leaders, and it was more like a, a, a social democratic situation. There was the were leaders, but the church. Everyone in the church was on the same level. And when the state church came in, the people learned about uh, 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 authority. The one guy says, I am the priest, I'm ordained, I'm in charge, and you should do what I do and say what I say. And without me, you have no authority. So they took the authority away from the normal believers and put it in the church, state church. And the state church controlled everything. What what bell rings with you with that? Back, if you go back in the future from me. When last did you have that control? The Pharisees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees controlled the Jewish religion. So you had the same thing back again after a few hundred years. Everything came back to that. Christ came, the revelation of the freedom in Christ came. New life in Christ came, a new church, people were free, 
At last, they could worship God, and what happened again? Here, the whole thing, the church took the place from the Pharisees, and Pharisees became the controlling factor in the church. And, and a lot of the church today are, is still there, unfortunately. People are not really free to worship as they please. It's not ordained by the church. It's illegal and bad, and you don't do that. And yet, he can get chopped off, which happened a lot, that people were punished. They were burned at the stake if they don't agree to the church, if they don't follow everything in the church. Satanicalism, it was a sacrament that believed in that the church has decreed certain things as holy, and you should do them, and if you don't do them, you are not under the church anymore. You can't be a Christian if you're not in the church and take part of the sacrament. So the priest should give you the biscuit on your tongue and the wine to drink. And so I so literally believe that they make us more transubstantialism. And transubstantialism was also a way of control. I think some of the reformers broke away from that because it in, in true Christian entity, we cannot really believe that this piece of biscuit or a piece of bread will turn into uh, the flesh of Christ. That is not necessary to believe it. We do it as a symbol or a memorial uh, to what we know in our hearts Christ has done for us. And we, we can talk about that, maybe it can differ from what I believe about it, but we cannot use the sacraments, especially the Lord's Supper, as a way of controlling and manipulating anything. Sacramentalism, also the priest, is the only person who may authorize anything. He is responsible for your soul. What kind of theology does that recall? What comes up in your head when you hear that? You are responsible. He, I'm responsible for your soul, Jesus. Does that sound right? No, you are responsible for your relationship with Jesus, not me. Mm -hmm. I'm your brother and I can, maybe if I see something, I can talk to you about it and say, hey, I've been just sending your life and you should be from. But I don't have authority, I don't take that place. Jesus takes the only place between us and God. Eh? Yeah. That is what we believe and that is the right faith. That we call the priesthood of the believer. Okay, it's a very sacred thing. You cannot mess with it. The moment you mess with it, you get to religions where people try to play Jesus in your life and then disappear. Okay. Then later in the first century, you even get magic and superstition. Now all the hidden aspects has crept back in, has come into the church because of the hidden priests that were just ordained as Christian ministers. And they brought all the stuff for us. They all the haha stuff into the church. And now we get magic and superstition. You know, people believe if if you touch this, then this will happen. You get some of the things in the Roman Catholic Church still today that reminds you of that. Black cat. Black cat. Oh, a lot of that stuff like that came in. Correct in. But the correct in as gospel, as, as truth. And people believed it. And they would even kill people if they don't. And the devil was laughing all the way. He says, oh, look what I've done in the church. That's exactly what I want. I don't want people to be real and believe the truth. Yes. You must be very careful not, not to be superstitious. But if you know the truth and follow by heart, by and that's why you do theology. Theology keeps your brain clear about God and about the Bible. If you do that, live it and teach it to other people, God will keep you on the right way. You will never be superstitious and full of magic. Magic today, you get a lot of Hollywood magic today. So we know where that is. That's not Christian. That has to do with occult and Satanism and lots of other things. Yeah, that came because of the conversion of pagan tribes of the north. You know, the, these guys were real pagans and they were all brought in under the church to serve them. Relics, you know what relics is? I've got the toe of the Apostle John and therefore it is holy, I keep it in my cupboard. And I've got my own shrine of, of holiness here and if you, you must come and kiss, kiss the toe of John and then you will be holy. All 
kind of stuff like that. They had so many doubles of the stuff. One of the uh, 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 limbs of one of the guys were repeated thousands of times. Everybody has got one. That one has got the, the arm of that apostle, and that one's also got the arm, and that one's got the arm, and that one. Like when you know this must be a host. Then it can't be real. You know, too many. You only got one limb, and the, so at the apostles. I doubt if any of that limbs or, or uh, body parts that they had were in any way related to any of the apostles at any time. It was just a way of superstition and magic. Muslims also practice um, the use of phrenics. Really? Uh, I'm not surprised. I would be surprised. Western Catholic Church? Symbolism became literal. Now that was where we, the Son of Substantiation came from. So, supper was a sacrament. They make everything a sacrament. It's not a biblical concept. It's a Latin word. It's not a Greek word. Eh? Mm -hmm. Sacrament is not Greek. It's Latin. Mm -hmm. Because the church language was Latin because of the Roman influence. It was Roman. The, therefore the Vulgate was also Latin. Everything was Latin. But the original Greek and the original um, language and vibe of the church was not there anymore. So the man was under the control of the priest. There was uh, worship. There was worship of the Virgin Mary, which is nothing else but the worship of the Queen of Heaven, pagan. Not Christian. Not Christian. The Bible never ever asked us to worship Mary. Not in any way, not at the, in the least. Christ is to be worshipped. And Christ alone, not with Virgin Mary and leaning over his shoulder. All men fall short of the glory of God and then gives Mary. Transubstantiation, I know there's a lot of we can say about or people believe certain things of transubstantiation. Um, there's a sound uh, way of looking at it. If you stay within these parameters, that is fine. You can deviate a little but not up too much. Then, of course, all these things would boil out like that to in the Reformation. Yeah. Okay, that's what I see between the brackets, what I say not the first single sacraments were used to two. There were a lot of sacraments, you know, it started out when your baby and ended when you die. And the church was there all the time to lead you through the process. If you don't follow that, you can't really go to heaven. That's what they believe. John Calvin, the presence of Christ was not in the elements. The, the, the reformers differed a lot because people differ. We are not the same. We don't believe all the same things um, because everything is not the same for everyone because we think differently. And that is fine. If we believe that sure fundamentals and believe scripture and are willing to be corrected out of scripture, you are okay. You may think differently from me even. I don't mind about that. As long as you can talk in a nice manner, you're welcome to think. We can always learn something from someone else. Okay? Radical reformers found to restore the New Testament all of them wanted to go back in the worship Try to see if they can't worship the way that in as apostolic time. But things were so different now. To really go back to that simplicity lifestyle must maybe oversimplification. That's what I think. Um, they thought of let's go get together and just have a meal together and talk about God and, and praise Jesus in a simple I do pray the Greek agree to that. I think we must get more simple in our faith. And and especially there, was a, there were a bunch of people who went to live in America in certain places and called the Fisher Folk. They made music. I mean, listen to the music. It was beautiful. The, the Spirit of God really ministered to my heart through their music. They were simple people, just living simple way of praying, praying together, praising God. That's good. That's wonderful. Um, but churches today are not like that, they're more intricate, there's a lot of other practical things to be considered today. They talk about Baptist and the three churches. Baptist is more, a bit more traditional to the Baptist theology, which I can't discuss now. And the three churches were a bit more free from tradition. 
They don't believe in doing a thing because people say do that. They believe in doing a new thing, uh, a new activity that will make meaning and sense in them for them at that stage. That's why they are free. In my time when I was a national service in, in the 80s, uh, the pastor would say, the people would say, all oh, the guys from the free churches, you can go now. And then they leave the guys and they go on to the church and come out from free churches for the first time. Today, most of the non-traditional churches are free churches. The uh, uh, majority churches become a free church. Everybody opens up a new church at the street corner. That's my new church, give it a Greek or a, or a Hebrew or a, uh, some way out Latin name. And you've got a, voila, there you've got a new church. You've got a pastor, you've got a new church. <laughs> and you worship God. And we all try to see if we can't please everybody. Almost. Okay. Um, this reminds me of a legal concept um, in terms of churches. If you set up a church um, that is not a state ch uh, church and is not controlled by the uh, state, um, it is um, legally called a free ch uh, church because um, the state um, doesn't tell you what to preach, it doesn't restrict you in any uh, way. And um, you serve God as you see the Bible teach. Um, they teach it so that yeah, yeah, that's right. That's In certain countries, they oppose and persecute Christians when you are part of the free church. They don't recognize the church as a church when it's a free church. Yeah, so a, a country might set up different denominations and say these and different denominations are allowed. So you're allowed to be a Christian inside that country. But you must choose one of the denominations that yeah. is represented. Yeah, well, the state wants to control because they know the moment they don't control, mm -hmm. people will start to, to catch them out and they, they will, uh, uh, elements will rise up which will destroy the authority and they're afraid of that and therefore they, they're trying to keep a hand, a leash on the, on the churches.